Job 42, 1, the Bible reads, then, an then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. Now, when we look at these statements from Job in chapter 42, they have to be taken in the context of the whole rest of the book. Here we see Job just falling over himself to just say to the Lord that he's just repenting and that he loathes himself and that he's nothing and that God can do everything. But what we have to understand is that Job is just recognizing God's greatness in comparison with himself. Now, some people will take these scriptures here in the first six verses of Job 42 and try to twist this to say that somehow Job actually was guilty before God. You know, almost like the three friends were right who kept accusing Job of being a sinful person. But we have to remember that God made it crystal clear in Job chapters 1 and 2 that Job was a perfect and an upright man that feared God and eschewed evil. And God said, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth that, that fears God and eschews evil? So we know that he was the greatest man living on the earth at that time. He was not being punished. The Bible says that everything that happened to Job was done unto him without cause. It was God just doing it to test him not as a result of any sin or anything that, that Job had done. But what we learn from these uh, last four or five chapters of the book of Job is that even the greatest man on this earth is nothing in comparison with God. Just as Jesus said of John the Baptist, there hath not risen a greater man of them that are born of women than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So this is the greatest man on earth being very humble before God. He talks about repenting and abhorring himself. And he's just saying, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. I, I said things that I didn't understand. But, but here's the thing. We have to let God be the judge of Job's character, not let Job be the judge of God's character. The Bible says this, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. So even if a guy like Job says, oh man, I'm so sorry, I don't even know what I'm talking about, I'm a complete loser, you know, th th that doesn't really mean it's true. This is just Job being humble. Job views himself in a very negative light in chapter 42, verses 1 through 6, and some people will misinterpret that, and then they'll view Job in a negative light. No, this is Job viewing himself in a negative light because he's very humble, and he realizes God's greatness and God's superiority to himself. But from the outside, as we look at Job, knowing the whole story, knowing what the Bible says, chapters 1 through 42, we know that Job is a great man. We know that he is a godly man. And in fact, when we see what God speaks, we don't see God attacking Job or criticizing Job whatsoever. Because look at verse 7. It says, It was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, and that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right like my servant Job. So when we look at what God has to say about Job, it's all positive. He's my servant Job. I will accept him. He spoke what was right. So just because he says, oh man, I, I spoke of things that I didn't understand. God says you spoke what was right. And you did right. You say, well, what was the purpose of God uh, going on and on about his greatness for the last four chapters and, and telling Job how much better he is than Job? The purpose is that before God could exalt and lift up Job, he has to make sure that Job understands his place. The Bible says before honor comes humility. So God was just trying to make sure that Job did not get too puffed up or too prideful or too exalted. So before he exalts him greatly in the presence of all his friends, he first has to humble him 
and just tell him, even though you're a great guy, I'm way more powerful and more righteous than you've ever thought of being. So that's the basic gist of what's going on in those early verses. And again, this is why you have to read the whole book of Job and take the whole context and understand the whole story from start to finish. But let's start at the beginning here. It says in verse 2, Job said, I know that thou canst do everything. Now, what Job means there is that everything that's been listed over the last four chapters, he's acknowledging that God is able to do those things. So we have to get this in context. This isn't saying that God can do anything, period. He's saying, I, can, I know that you can do everything, meaning all the things that he just went over. Because if you get the last four chapters, it was God saying, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Did you know this? Do you know this? Are you able to do this? And that's what Job's responding to when he says that God can do everything. Because here's the thing, in an absolute sense, it is not accurate to say that God can do anything. And here's why. Because the Bible says that God cannot lie. Amen. So the idea that God can do anything is not biblical. But what the Bible does say is that God is omnipotent. And omnipotent means all-powerful. So God is all-powerful. God has all power and all ability. But God cannot lie. First of all, the Bible says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. It also says in Hebrews chapter 6 that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. It also says if we deny, it, the Bible also says if we believe not yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So there are things that God cannot do. He cannot lie. He cannot do anything wrong. He cannot do anything unrighteous because he is light and in him is no darkness at all. So God is limited to what he has said he would do in his word. He's not going to break his promise. He's not going to tell lies. But he can do everything that was just listed, is what Job 42, verse 2 is saying. It says that no thought can be withholden from thee. God even knows all of our thoughts. That's very true. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is that it says in verse number seven, and it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, my wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my ser servant Job hath. And here we see that when people speak of God and it's wrong, that makes God angry. When people preach false doctrine about who the Lord is and about who Jesus is, that's something that gets God mad. His wrath becomes kindled when people claim to speak the word of God and they actually speak things that are false. It says in verse number eight, Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly and that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job hath. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Naamathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. Now when the Bible there says the Lord accepted Job, it's talking about when he prayed for his three friends. It's not, you know, Job standing with God has never been in question here. But it's saying that Job is supposed to pray for the three friends, Job prays for them, and then God accepts Job, meaning that he answers that prayer. Look at verse 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. What's interesting about this is that God blessing Job and restoring his wealth unto him is a result of him praying for his three friends. Because it specifically says there that the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Now go to 2 Chronicles chapter 1, because this is an interesting concept in the Bible where when we pray, sometimes God will give us things that we didn't even ask for when we pray. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that we don't know how to pray for ourselves as we ought to. I mean, do you ever just go to pray and you just don't really know what to pray for? Yeah. And maybe there's a certain situation and somebody said, hey, would you pray for me? And you're kind of at a loss. You don't know what to pray. And the Bible says in Romans 8 that, that we know not how to pray as we ought, but that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So basically, when we pray to God, the Holy Spirit steps in and he'll bring the messages to God that we don't really know how to express or that we don't really even know to pray for. 
uh, he will intercede and, and get the message to God that, that God needs to get. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 1, we have a great example with Solomon. Now Solomon had just become king and he wants to start his kingdom right. He wants to seek after the Lord and, and be a godly king. So it says in verse uh, 6 of 2 Chronicles 1, And Solomon went up thither to the brazen altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of the congregation, and offered a thousand burnt offerings upon it. So he takes a thousand animals and offers a thousand burnt offerings on this altar. Just trying to right away show God his submission to him and, and uh, his love for God. It says in verse 7, In that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. So, I mean, this is basically God just coming to him and giving him a carte blanche. Just, what do you want? Whatever you want, just ask. Because you've done something for me, I'm going to do something for you. It says in verse 8, And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast showed great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established, for thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people that is so great? So here he's given the opportunity to ask something for himself. And instead of asking something for himself, he actually is really asking for others. Because yes, he's asking for wisdom and knowledge so that he can do right by others, so that he can judge the people. Because he knows that as king, the welfare of his people is his responsibility and he wants to do a good job and make sure that he does what's right for his followers. And so he prays for wisdom and knowledge to be given unto him. And look what God says in verse 11. And God said to Solomon, because this was in thine heart and thou hast not asked riches, wealth or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet hast asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee. And I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee, neither shall there any after thee have the like. So here, God gives him what he asks for, wisdom and knowledge, but he also says, I'm going to give you all the things you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you riches. I'm going to give you honor. I'm going to give you long life. I'm going to give you the lives of your enemies because you asked for wisdom. Now, the Bible tells us over and over again in Proverbs that wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the most important thing that we can get in our lives. It's way more important than, than any kind of wealth we could have. And, and really, wisdom gets you wealth anyway. Because if you have wisdom, you would have the smarts to go out and make money and, and make something happen. Whereas if you have money but you have no wisdom, you're going to waste it all. I mean, think about how many people who've had great wealth and they spent it all, wasted it all, and, and did stupid things with it. So wisdom is more valuable because wisdom can give you wealth. Wisdom can give you a long life because it'll teach you not to eat garbage food and not to do stupid things that could shorten your life. And so it could teach you to take care of yourself or to, you know, whatever, uh, not risk your life in, in foolish ways. But what the Bible's teaching here is that when we care about other people and pray for other people and our prayer is not just a selfish prayer, God's going to give us what we need for ourselves also and he's going to give us what we need for other people too. It reminds me of when the Bible says, ye have not because ye ask not, when it's talking about prayer in James chapter 4. But then it also says, ye ask and have not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. So when we're just praying for God to give us all the things that we want to make us feel good and, and to give us prosperity and to give us our way and this and that and the other, the Bible says we're not going to receive. He's not going to answer us. He said, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. So if our prayer is a prayer to consume something on our lust, God's not going to answer that prayer. But if our prayer is for things that are according to God's will, and if our prayer is an unselfish prayer for our friends, for our loved ones, then God will answer that prayer. So if I pray for you, for God to bless you, you know, that's a lot more likely to get answered than praying for God to bless me, if I'm praying for myself. It's better for me to pray for other people and pray for the things that they need. And if I pray for myself, 
I should pray for wisdom for myself so that I can be a good father, so that I can be a good husband, so that I can be a good pastor or whatever the case may be. So think about that when you pray because God wants to answer our prayers. He says, if you ask anything, you know, according to his will, he heareth us. And, and if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire from. So God will answer prayer. It, it's definitely worth it to pray. And he definitely will step in and, and help out in the situations that we ask his help. But we need to make sure that we're praying right, that it's not a selfish thing where we're just praying for fancy cars and fancy houses and, and you know, God, give me this, God, give me that. That's not the kind of prayer that God wants to hear from us. But the Bible does say, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. That is one prayer that is always guaranteed to be answered if you pray for wisdom. Oh God, give me wisdom. God, give me wisdom. Give me knowledge. Give me understanding. And that's the most valuable thing. So why wouldn't you be asking for it anyway? Anyone who doesn't ask for it is being foolish because the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. If you pray for prosperity and don't have the wisdom to go with it, it's going to ruin your life. Just like people win the lottery, it ruins their life. People make it big in Hollywood or in the rock and roll scene, and it ruins their life. They commit suicide. They're miserable. Why? Because those things can't bring you happiness, and those things can't bring you success in life. You know, maybe in the world's eyes you'll be a success, but you'll be a failure in God's sight. So if you look at Solomon's example here, you see that praying for others is the way to pray, and then God will take care of your needs anyway. And the Bible says this, your, fa your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of all these things. And the Bible says your father knoweth that you have need of these things. He says he knows what you have need of before you ask. Because the Bible talks about how the heathen use vain repetitions. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. So you don't have to sit there and just keep asking God for the same things because he already knows what you want. He already knows what you need. Spend time praying for other people. And if you spend time praying for other people, God will give you exactly what's best for you. You might not even know what's best for you, but he does. So spend time praying for other people, and then God will bless you. And that's exactly what we see in Job 42. He prays for his three friends, and when he prays for his three friends, he gets what he needs. He gets his life restored. Now, what had happened to Job? Well, first of all, his uh, 10 children have died. His wife told him, curse God and die. He's covered in boils and sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, and he was scraping himself with pieces of pottery just to alleviate some of the burning and itching and inflammation. So he's in extreme physical pain. His 10 children have died. All 10 of his children have died. He lost all of his wealth, all of his servants, have just left. All of his old friends have turned on him and are blaming him. Not even his wife is sticking up for him. So he is pretty much going through every possible calamity that a human being could go through. His health, his finances, his relationships, loss of, of children, and so forth. So let's see what happens in the end of the story. After he prays for his three friends, it says in verse 10, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now, this kind of explains how he got his wealth back because it's kind of hard to going from just having nothing to just being this wealthy man with all this cattle. Have you ever heard the saying, it takes money to make money? You have to have some money to get started with, some capital to get started with. You know, a lot of people just borrow money to get started, but sometimes borrowing money is not that easy. I remember when I started my fire alarm business back in 2008, I had only like $6,000, and I was starting this fire alarm business, and there was just so much work out there, and there was so much money to be made, and I, you know, at first I was just going to be really conservative and just start it real slow, but then I thought, you know, there's just so much work out there, there's just so much money to be made. I need to make hay while the sun is shining here, you know? So I actually just racked up every credit card and just borrowed a ton. I literally borrowed $70,000 on, and I mean, you know, that'll kind of, if you're one who has a, a real strong grip on the things of this world, that'll keep you up at night. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I just thought, you know, 
just take it one day at a time here. But there was a time when I had $70,000 racked up. And I'm not recommending that. I'm not saying, hey, that's how you start a business. But that's what I did. And I had $70,000 in debt at the worst. But, the, but people owed me like $100,000. And I owed like 70,000. But here's the thing though. You don't know if those people are going to pay because a lot of people don't pay. I would say in the course of me running my fire alarm business, I probably only got paid for about 90 to 95%, probably 95%, probably 5% just didn't pay. You know, I mean, it was just something you had to kind of factor in like 5% of the bills just aren't going to get paid and you're never going to get paid. But I, when I worked for my other boss, there, there was a company that owed us $40,000 and they went out of business never paid. So things like that happened. So it was kind of a little bit, a little risky there, you know, but thank God, you know, everybody paid and I paid off all that debt and I was able to be in the black uh, in about a year after starting my business. I paid all that off. But here's the thing though, you know, th the only reason I was able to borrow $70,000 is because this was before the crash really had set in. This was when credit was just easy. There's just credit cards, loans. It was easy to get loans back. Because if I would have started my business a year or two later, it wouldn't have been the same. Because after that, they, every, the, all my credit cards, they started cutting the credit limit on them. And I called them up and I said, I've never paid a bill late. My credit is perfect. Why are you cutting my limit? They just said, we're cutting everybody's limits. Because they just, you know, credit just wasn't as free after that. But again, in order to borrow money, you even have to show them that you have money in order to borrow money or you have to show them that you have money coming in. So if you're a guy like Job, who's sitting there covered in sores, scraping yourself, and you don't have any cattle, you don't have any money, it's gonna take you a while to build that herd back up to full strength. You don't even have one animal. I mean, what do you do? I guess you'd go and work for somebody else and you know, tend their animals and then make some money and then buy your first couple animals. And I mean, that'd be a really difficult process. But here's what God did. It, it was actually easier for that than Job. God makes it easy for him. Read verse 11. It says, Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also, and here's the key, every man also gave him a piece of money and everyone an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. So how did this blessing of the Lord come about? It came through human means. It came through human instrumentality. It wasn't just that God rained money down from heaven, and it wasn't just that Job just took out a line of easy credit. You know, I don't even know if they had easy credit like that back then. See, it's really easy for people to loan you $70,000 when they print money out of thin air, and it's all electronic, and it's all fake money. So that, you know, that's why it was so easy to borrow that money back in 2008. But here we see how Job got his money back. Because what happened is, all of his friends, all of his acquaintances, all of his family, now they feel sorry for him. At first, they had all turned on him. They'd all forsaken him. But now, God has given them a change of heart, and they come back, and they're sorry, and they feel bad. So everybody gives him a piece of money, and everyone gives him an earring of gold. And all that money adds up. So now he's got a bunch of money and a bunch of gold earrings, and obviously, he's not just going to put on all his earrings like, and look like Mr. T or something, you know, with a bunch of jewelry. So what he does is he obviously takes that money and starts buying cattle, and he builds it up again through hard work. He builds up the herd again. And so in the end, after getting all that money, that's like his startup money that he needed, goes out, buys the animal, and gets things going. And then it says in verse number 12, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep. And you can just take my word for it that if you compare these numbers to chapter 1, it's exactly double. He has twice as much of everything. 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, and 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 she-asses. And then here's what's interesting. In verse 13, it says, he had also seven sons and three daughters. Now, what's interesting about that is that in the beginning, how many children did he have? Ten. So here, God's blessing him with twice as much but does he have twice as many children? But I believe the reason why is because when you lose sheep, they're gone. When you lose camels, they're gone. When you lose asses, they're gone. But when you lose your children, his children were devout children, they're in heaven. So in order for him to be doubled, God doesn't have to give him 20 children. By giving him 10 more, 
he's got double. In the beginning, he had 10 children. Now he's got 20. Because the Bible teaches, you know, we don't mourn like those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. So Job's children, they're still alive. They still exist. That's why he only gets 10. Now, I'm assuming this is the same wife. You know, there's no mention of him getting a different wife or his wife dying or anything. So I'm assuming it's the same wife that told him, curse God and die. Uh, it comes back and, and says, she's sorry. Which, that doesn't really surprise me. You say, well, good night. I mean, after she told him, curse God and die, I mean, their marriage must be over. But here's the thing about that, though. A lot of people, they make the mistake of thinking that if they have a big fight in their marriage, that, like, their marriage is just over. It's over. But guess what? Most people who are married have some pretty big fights in their marriage. I mean, this idea that, just, and, and again, if you say, well, not me. I've never had a fight in my marriage. Well, okay, fine. You know, you're that person. <laughs> but most people, most normal people, if they're around each other every single day and they're married and they're living together, there's going to be some conflict. There's going to be some strife. There are going to be bad days. And you think, oh, no, you know, me and so-and-so, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my fiance, you know, we're never going to disagree. We're never going to fight. But you're not married yet. And, and you say, well, you know, we've been married, but we've been married for three months. And, you know, it, it comes later. <laughs> okay? Now, you say, why would you say that, Pastor Anderson? And, and sometimes when I've been preaching before, and I've been talking about marriage, and I'll be showing stuff from the Bible, and I'll say things like, you know what, it's normal if there are problems in your marriage or fighting or if, if there are times when you don't get along. Or, or saying things like that marriage has ups and downs. There are going to be times when it's really good. There are going to be other times when it's not good. And you got to hang in there through the rough patches. I've had people get offended by that kind of preaching. And just, oh, how can you say that? But that's so unspiritual. And, well, you know, you fight with your wife. Blah, blah, blah. You know, we're supposed to love her as Christ loved the church. And blah, blah, blah. But here's, here's the thing about that, though. You know, but can I tell you exactly why I've gotten up and said things like that? Because actually pastors who get up and just act like, oh, my marriage is perfect, it's always been perfect, and I've never had any marital problems, and it's always been just wonderful, and we just have always loved each other so much every day, and we just wake up. Every morning when my wife and I wake up, it's that song. Do, 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 You know, and we're just, it's all just one romantic Hollywood movie from start to finish. Every day, every night, it's perfect. But here's the problem with that. Because then the people in the congregation, you know what they're thinking? Oh, man. I married the wrong person. <laughs> oh, no. My marriage is horrible. You know, uh, uh, my marriage is nothing like Pastor Anderson. So what, it, what happens is Hollywood and TV are already putting out there an unrealistic view yeah. of relationships and marriage where everybody rides off into the sunset and everything's perfect and it's just super duper romance every single day of the week. And the problem is that when we, when we go to church and we hear the same thing, oh yeah, if you just follow Ephesians 5, everything's perfect. Yeah, just follow Ephesians 5, there's never going to be a problem. The problem with saying that is that then when people have problems, which they're going to, then they think it's just them. It's just me. I must have married the wrong person. We're not compatible. You know, this isn't going to work. But if we get a more realistic view of marriage going into marriage, then marriage can last. See, it's better to know. It's, it's sort of like the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. You know, teaches you, oh, you're never going to have to face anything. You're never going to have to face any persecution of the Antichrist. Or the you know, so then you're not ready for it when it happens, right? Let me, you know, this, this pre-trib marriage philosophy, this, 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 this marriage that has no tribulation, and then people get married, right? And then tribulation comes in their marriage. I'm not saying there's a beast involved or anything, but I'm saying, you know, you go into your marriage and then you have problems, and then what happens? Woo, what's happening? You know, and then you're offended. Whereas if you go into, I like to tell people going into marriage, and let them know, look, marriage is great. Marriage is wonderful. And I can honestly stand up here and say from the bottom of my heart that my wife and I have a wonderful marriage. We get along great. 
We love each other. And honestly, our relationship is much better and deeper than it was even when we were newlyweds. I mean, when we were newlyweds, we were so happy. We were dirt poor. We didn't even have a bed to sleep in. We had a, a twin mattress on the floor. We had two plates, two forks, two spoons, two cups, no couch, no table, no chairs. We were just so happy and in love. You know, we were newlywed. But honestly, we have, we have better times now than we even did then. And so we love each other great. But look, I'd be lying to you if I got up here and said, hey, it's always been like that. It's always been great. It's always been wonderful. Because guess what? It hasn't. Because life isn't like that. And when you go through marriage, there are ups and downs. There are bad times that you go through together. And look, when you're going through bad times, or your wife is going through bad times, or both of you are going through bad times, and there are going to be times when there's serious conflict and when it gets ugly. You know, I mean, that's just the way life, life's not always going to just be a beautiful Hollywood movie. But the problem is, some people have their heads so far in a TV that they start thinking it's real. And then they're like, well, but I watch reality shows. <laughs> Those aren't real either. <laughs> reality TV is an oxymoron. <laughs> it's not real. None of it's real. It's, everything on TV is fake. You say, well, I watch this show. And, you know, let me give you a perfect example. There's a, there's a famous reality show. Uh, called the Duggars, or whatever it's called, 19 kids and counting, or 18 kids and counting, however many they're up to now. And on this show of the Duggars, 19 kids and counting, no one's ever spanked. But the kids are all good. I'll bet you any amount of money that those kids are being spanked. But you don't see it on the show. But you know it's happening. Why? Because no one is going to even have 19 kids if they don't spank them because they'd be just swinging from the chandeliers. You know what I mean? They would have murdered their parents by now, you know? So what I'm saying is that TV, even reality TV, isn't really showing you the whole picture. Even if you say, well, I watch this show. I, you name the show, I'll tell you what's not real about it. But people spend so much time watching Hollywood movies and TV of all this just romance. And, and look, I believe in romance. My wife and I have all kinds of romance. But you know what? You're never going to be able to achieve the goal of just romance 365 days a year. It's not going to happen. I've tried it. It doesn't work. <laughs> I'm just telling you, it's just not real. It's just not reality. And you know, it's real e when you first get married and it's just you and your spouse, it's pretty easy to, to, to just have all the romance and all that. You know, then when the kids start coming, though, it gets more challenging. That, that brings a new challenge. You know, and, 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 you know, you go through life, there are all kinds of challenges. Plus, there's a difference between being married for one year and five years and ten years. There are different phases you go through, different challenges you go through. And I can honestly, I'm not just getting up here and just saying this just for effect or something, but I literally feel that my marriage is, is better now than it's ever been as far as just, and I'm not saying every single day, but I'm saying in general, I like my marriage now better than I did even when I was a newlywed. So marriage does get better. And that's what people don't realize when they quit. Because a lot of people, when they get to a bad patch in their marriage, what do they do? They quit. They bail at the low point. And there's going to be a low point, my friend. There is going to be a low point and many low points. But here's the thing. When you bail at the low point, you never make it to the good times. Because marriage will get good again. And in fact, it'll get even better than it's ever been if you can hang in there and stay through the rough patches. And obviously, you know, you got to follow the Lord and you've got to do things God's way. You got to be unselfish. You got to love your spouse, all the things that go into it. But it will get better. It will improve. And so that's one thing that we can learn from this story with Job. I mean, here's Job's wife telling him, you know, curse God and die. But here's the thing. If my wife, if my wife's 10 children died, she'd probably tell me to curse God and die. You know, and I'm not saying that to criticize her. I'm saying probably any woman, think about how women are with their kids. I mean, at least they should be very affectionate toward their children. Women obviously are very affectionate for the children. And this woman gave birth 10 times to 10 children and all of her children are dead. She's going to say some mean things. And here's the, I don't think she hated Job. She's just flying off at the handle because she's, and here's the thing. If someone in our church had 10 children and all 10 children died, I don't care what that person said to me. I would not hold it against them. 
I mean, if somebody in our church, if all their children died, and they walked up to me and said, Pastor Anderson, you blankety blank, 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 it's your fault, and I hate you, and, you know, I would, I would forgive that person in a heartbeat, just because you just realize what they're going through. Now, I'm not saying it would be right for them to do that, but pretty much anything that they said would be excusable, in my opinion. Now, you know, between them and God, it's between them and God what God thinks about what they said. But as far as I'm concerned, if anybody's going through that kind of struggle, I'd be really lenient and forgiving. And, you know, so that's why I'm really forgiving of Job's wife. I don't think she was a bad person. I think that, you know, she was just going through a bad time and said something stupid. It was, what she said was stupid. What she said was blasphemous. What she said was sinful. I don't know exactly how God felt about what she said. God doesn't really tell us exactly what he felt. I know, he, I know it was wrong. But I'll say this, though. I'm personally not going to stand in, in harsh judgment of her because of what she was going through. And all that to say this. There are a lot of things in the Bible where you, where you see marital strife. You see, you know, for example, Zipporah, Moses' wife, throwing a bloody foreskin at him. You know, that's a pretty serious fight. You know what I mean? When, somebody's, when, when, when your wife's throwing a bloody foreskin at you, you know, that's a big fight. And that's, what, hey, that's exactly what happened in the book of Exodus. And she's saying, oh, you, you're a bloody husband and throwing stuff. You know, look, there are fights in the Bible where people are throwing things. So what I'm saying is, you know, don't get this out. And you say, why would you preach this? Why would you even talk about this? Because here's the thing. You're going to go through stuff in your marriage, and it might not be the exact things that I'm talking about here. Hopefully it's not to that degree. But honestly, just because your spouse says something mean to you, it's, not, it's over. That's it. And remember the sermon from Sunday on forgiveness? You know, you've got to forgive. You've got to move on. And honestly, just because you think it's over, it's not over. Guess when it's over? When you die or when your spouse dies. Because the Bible says that, it, it, that marriage, you know, is, is something where they're joined together. And what God had joined together, let not man put asunder. It's till death do us part. And so you just got to keep that in mind. And I'm not trying to scare you about marriage if you're a single person. You know, it, <laughs> be afraid. Be very afraid. <laughs> no, I'm just, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not trying to scare you. But as my beloved sons, I warn you. You know, as, Paul, as the Apostle Paul said. You know, it's, I'm just telling you that if you go into marriage with an attitude of, you know what? There are going to be some rough patches. There are going to be times when I say stuff I shouldn't say and when she says stuff that she shouldn't say. But you know what? Pastor Anderson said that, w that it was going to happen. And when it happens, I'm not going to freak out. I'm not going to go over. I'm not going to go home to my parents. You know, the proverbial wife goes to her parents. You know, that's why I married a woman whose parents are on the other side of the world. You got nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah. But you know, the proverbial, oh, she runs home to mama. Don't freak out when things go bad. You know, just, I remember, you know, whenever I first got married, my si you know, I was like, oh, I'll get a studio apartment. My sister was like, no, you need to get a one bedroom. Don't get a studio apartment. I said, why not? You know, we're, we're poor. And she's like, you got to have somewhere to go when there's a fight. You know, you got to have somewhere to go and just shut the door and cool off. And, and I was like, fight? What are you talking about? You know? But she was right. You know, you got to have that bedroom. But the point is, you know, don't go to mama and run home to mama, you just go in the other room and just cool off and chill out. And guess what? It's all going to blow over. And, and if you're godly, if you're Christ-like, you're going to forgive and forget. And then you can have a wonderful marriage and a wonderful relationship. But don't get this attitude that it's all over. And not just about marriage, just in life. Just don't get this attitude of just, it's over. There are so many times when I felt like it's over with my, with my fire alarm business. I remember in September 2009, just, it's over. Game over. It's done. I mean, I felt like my life was over in September 2009. You know, th there are times when you go through life and you're just sitting there like, okay, I just lost everything. Okay, goodbye, everything. But you know what? Everything turned out fine. I hung in there. My business was fine. The church was fine. Family was fine. Everything was fine. You just hang in there. You just ride it out. And that's what Job did through the whole book of Job. I mean, that's what we learned through the book of Job. The patience of Job. He hung in there. He wrote it out. He didn't do anything stupid. You know, he just 
didn't jerk the steering wheel. He just stayed with the Lord. He stayed true. He hung in there. He went through the pain and suffering. He didn't freak out when his wife told him to curse God and die. He just hung in there. And guess what? In the end, everything was great. You've got to learn to go through the trials and not run away. You know, and here's the thing. You have a problem with your marriage and you run away. Guess what's going to happen in the second marriage? Problems. You're like, oh man, why, what am I, why did I leave my first spouse when it, it turns out I was the problem? Or, or, or it turns out all women are like that. Or it turns out all men are like that. And by the way, all women are like that. All men are like that. Oh, my husband, you know, doesn't fix things around the house. Neither do I. Oh, my husband leaves everything. So do I. Oh, my wife nags me, you know, whatever. No, no comment. But anyway, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, guess what? People are people. People make mistakes. I'm sure that I'm a pain in my, I'm a pain in my wife's neck sometimes. She's a pain in my neck sometimes. It's just, we're people. We're sinners. We're human beings. But the beauty of marriage is when you can hang in there and go through hard times together and get to when it gets good again and have a deeper, more meaningful relationship that has stood the test of time. You've been through the storms together and it just gets better and, and deeper and more meaningful. But you know, life is like that. You know, you just got to stay with church. And, and when you first come to church, it's like a honeymoon. Sometimes people first come to Faith Word Baptist Church, oh, this is the greatest church, I love it. There have been people, listen to me, who've moved here, who've moved to Phoenix, Arizona to come to our church and then eventually quit and go somewhere else. It's like you moved across the country to come here and then you don't even come here. Because, you know, the honeymoon's over and then, uh, you know, they don't know how to hang in there through rough times. So they just go running away and fleeing. The message of Job is patience, perseverance, and waiting for God to eventually come through for you because he's going to come through for you. <clears throat> so he got double everything that he got. It says, and he called the name of the first, he, he, had, he had seven sons and three daughters. He called the name of the first Jemima. This is proof that Job was black. Okay, this is pr proof positive. But anyway, I'm just kidding. But anyway, you know, Jemima. Okay, I don't know, that's not a popular name anymore for some reason, but now it's just a maple syrup pretty much. But anyway, I called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second, Kezia, or Kezia, and the name of the third, Karen Hapuk. And in the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. So God bless him with a beautiful family. He's got seven sons and three daughters, and his daughters are the most beautiful daughters in the land, and he's so proud of them, and he gives them an inheritance among their brethren, because he has so much inheritance. I mean, he just gives all 10 of them an inheritance. And then it says in verse 16, after this lived Job 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. And I guarantee you that Job appreciated what he had in the end because he'd gone through all the bad times. And the apostle Paul said, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And so the Apostle Paul, he went through really hard times where he was in jail, where he was beaten, where he didn't have any food to eat, where he was shipwrecked out in the ocean. And he said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. And so if we went through life and everything went well for us all the time, we wouldn't learn how to be content. We would be a spoiled brat. We have to go through times of suffering and want and hunger to make us appreciate the things that we have. I remember when I went to Germany for three months when I was 18, and in Germany, there's no free refills at any restaurant that you go to. I mean, can you imagine that? No free refills. And the drinks are tiny and the drinks are expensive. And if you go to a restaurant, they actually give you and only in Germany, but they give you a little glass that is like a measuring cup that has little lines on it. So instead of just, you know, in America, you just pour your glass of water, pour your glass of Coca-Cola, whatever. It has a little line that they fill it up to that says 0.5 liters or 0.2 liters. And usually I could only afford the 0.2 liters. 
okay? You know, sometimes I really splurged and got the 0.5 liter. I mean, in America, 0.5 liter, that's, that's about, what, a pint? That's like, okay, I'm ready for my refill now. <laughs> but I remember the first time I went to a restaurant in Germany, it was just like, all right, refill. And it's like, no, that's another $5. You're like, whoa, man. The drink was like almost, seriously, if the food was 10 bucks, the drink would be like five bucks. The drink was about half what the food would cost wherever you went. And then I remember the people that I was staying with, they had bottles of carbonated water, bottles of lemonade, but you could tell that they kind of felt that I was drinking a little too much water. <laughs> they didn't say anything, but it was kind of, oh, you're already done with the water that we gave you, huh? Oh, so you already drank that lemonade. So, you know, you started to get the message like, okay, I'm not supposed to be drinking a lot of water. You know, I'm used to growing up with just unlimited water. And they're like, don't drink the tap water. It's poison. Just drink this little measuring cup of, uh, you know, I know, man. So then I remember just the whole time I was there, just three months of being thirsty. Just three months of being thirsty. And I remember I got back and all I could think about was just drinking as much as I want. And I remember I got home and I went to the grocery store and I just bought like a bottle of apple juice, a bottle of orange juice, a bottle of soda. And I just went home and I'm just drinking and drinking. It's just, oh, it's so good. And it made you appreciate something that you never appreciated before. You know, and you didn't appreciate it because you hadn't gone three months of never getting enough to drink. And it was just so refreshing. That's how life is. You go through life just getting everything you want. It turns you into a bad person. It turns you into a spoiled brat. But when you go through periods of suffering and periods that are bad, it makes you enjoy the good times. So we need to just trust God and let him take us through some bad times if it's good for us. And just hang in there. Don't flip out. And you know what? I thank God that I've had financial problems. I thank God that I've had marital problems. I thank God that I've had health problems. Why? Because as a pastor, I can actually understand what people are going through. And I don't just, oh, you have marriage problems? You must just be an idiot. You're just a, you're just a loser. You know, if you were a stud like me, you'd never have any marriage problems. <laughs> you know, if you would just be a little more manly and have a little more leadership, you know, you'd be doing great. Loser? <laughs> Why doesn't your wife respect you? What are you doing wrong? You know, see, see how, what a bad attitude that would be for a pastor to have? It's better to be able to say, you know what, I understand what you're going through. I understand the situation. I understand the challenges because I've been there. Or I've known people, I've literally known people who've never had any financial problems and they just think like, oh, anybody who's poor is an idiot. They're not working hard. They're stupid. But honestly, I, I remember I went through a period where I was working really hard early in my marriage and everything. I was going to work, working hard, working overtime, doing well, and just barely scraping by and not having any money. And so I can empathize with people when they're struggling and, and trying to make ends meet because I've been there. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to have credit card debt. I know what it's like to go through these problems. So I'm not just up on this high horse where just, well, you know, it's all your fault and, and you're just, you just don't know how to handle money and you just aren't working hard. So, you know, I can actually have some sympathy for people. So maybe that's why God's putting you through things because maybe one day you're going to be able to help other people with similar problems. And you're going to be able to say, you know what, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it's going to be sincere from your heart when you say, you know what, I know what you're going through. I'm praying for you. I love you. I want to help you. Let me give you some advice. I've been there. We got to just trust God and go through whatever he has for us. And in the end, it's going to be great. I mean, you're going to have twice as much in the end, but you got to hang in there and you got to stay with the Lord. If Job would have bailed on God, though, I don't think this would have had a happy ending at all. Not everybody's life has a happy ending, but Job's did because he stayed with it and he died being old and full of days. You say, well, how old was he? Well, it says he lived 140 years after the story. Now, how old was he in the beginning? I don't know. This is back in the days when, you know, uh, Abraham's living to be 175 years old. People are living to be 180, 175, you know, uh, things like that. It was a different time. But, uh, you know, we don't really know how old he was. I know that Job's three friends 
were called very old by Elihu. Remember he said, I'm young, you're very old. And uh, we know that, that Job's three friends did kind of talk down to Job at one point about his age, talking about how all the old and wise men were with them that were older than Job's father. So, you know, making a little bit of a reference to Job's age. But how young can you be and have 10 kids? So he was a middle-aged man. So we don't know exactly how old he lived to be, but obviously even 140 is, is super old. Nobody even lives that long nowadays. But he lived 140 years after this. He got to see his sons and daughters, the third and fourth generation. He was blessed in all areas. Everything went well for him. And so uh, it, it, you say, well, is the prosperity gospel true that if we serve God, he's going to give us prosperity? Well, here's the thing. First, we go through trials and tribulations. In the end, we succeed. But sometimes that's in the next life. But most of the time, we'll succeed even in this life, eventually. But you've got to go through the bad times first, and you've got to hang in there. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the story of Job. It's a very encouraging story, Lord that just shows us that even when we think life's over and we think that nothing can ever go right again and our health is destroyed, our marriage is destroyed, our children are all dead and our finances are destroyed, the Bible says weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Lord, help us to have the faith to understand that if we stay with you and trust you and, and stay faithful, that our end will be blessed. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.